uh, was learning about uh, Juliet's work recently, and I thought it was fascinating and also cross-references with a number of dimensions of our world. And likewise, Jack, I, I think that the, 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 the thread that connects would partially be the thread that you were sharing on how to uh, exponentially accelerate uh, research journeys. Uh, hello, Tomas. Welcome. Hello, Bobby. Very good to speak with you, Tomas. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, cross-reference you with uh, fellow folks here on the line because, of course, this connects in the other thread. Um, I think, well, uh, ah, I see a 203 number here. Welcome to the 203 number. Thank you, Bobby. This is Mike Critelli. I'm going to go Mike. on mute. All good. Yeah. Welcome. Um, Thank and, you. Uh, if you Well, Michael, before you go on mute, if you want to do a just a quick introduction of yourself, I can then uh, invite you to, we'll go to the other colleagues to let them introduce, but if you just want to share a few words uh, with folks uh, so they uh, can can meet yourself, uh, I'd be I'd be delighted to, to introduce you to, to uh, our hashtag systems change uh, fellow folks on the line. And I think that we've got enough here now that we can actually consider that a, a beginning of a round of introductions, uh, if, if, if you will. Oh, and, thank you. Uh, um, we would warmly welcome that if you'd like. Yeah, um, I'm not sure where to start. Um, I probably, I, I have had a number of careers in my lifetime. Uh, the one that was the longest was going up the ranks at Pitney Bowes and eventually becoming chairman and CEO. But in a lot of ways, what we did at Pitney Bowes was a lot of grassroots innovation uh, using tools that had been in place since the early 1940s. So we believed very strongly in uh, getting systemic change through the wisdom of the crowds, uh, not only our employees, but later we did, uh, we were pioneers in user-centered innovation. <coughs> Clayton Christensen actually uh, wrote, case wrote a case study about and so when I heard about crowd doing systemic change initiatives, I, uh, I felt very much at home. And then I got even more at home talking to Bobby as we've gotten acquainted through a few calls in recent weeks. Phenomenal. Michael, we're grateful for your joining us and we look forward to the intersectionalities ac across the systemic change community. And one intersectionality is we just had a fellow Connecticut Connecticut human uh, join us on the call uh, in Nick Gogarty. Uh, maybe given that, uh, Nick, would you like to introduce yourself and then we'll go around the rest of the room? Uh, sure. Um, my name is Nick Gogarty. I'm uh, based in, in Connecticut, uh, deep background in um, uh, finance and technology, um, blockchain, Ivy League author for Columbia University. Um, doing, you know, yesterday I was uh, doing a, a, a panel on uh, biodiversity and uh, fintech uh, for a group spun out of the um, UN Undersecretary General's office, and also the same day doing uh, advisory work on uh, central bank distributed currencies um, and uh, blockchain. And I launched uh, SolarCoin, which is a renewable energy reward. Ph phenomenal. And thank you so much, Nick, and uh, reminding me of all the many ways in which you're working on uh, the, the research to practice gap in uh, collective problem solving. Uh, maybe that would be a good moment to invite Juliet. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself for our uh, systemic change colleagues who haven't met you? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name's Juliet. I work with an organization called Activate. We're a nonprofit that effectively helps um, scientists and engineers that have an innovation that can impact society to take that innovation out of academia um, and actually help it reach uh, the real world. So we're effectively um, offering a two-year fellowship where we cover um, the, the the people's uh, salary, full access to uh, these incredible national labs that we have partnerships with. And then we train them to make that transition from academia uh, to being an entrepreneur and setting up a company along the way. So a lot of our fellows have um, innovations that uh, require a level of systemic change uh, to truly be impactful. We work a lot on climate change um, and energy issues, uh, as well as a variety of other things. So 
that would be the, the link there is that academia um, to uh, real world application uh, as well as the climate change focus. One, one uh, adjacency that is in the room that I'll bring to attention <clears throat> is that uh, each uh, social innovation that gets to aspirational scale needs collaboration. We could contextualize to David Sherman if you'd like to introduce yourself given the collaboration gap in the world around every social innovation we might cherish the impact potential of. David? Okay, David, we'll come back to you if you're on mute. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm off mute. I, I'm a little slow with this software. Thank you, Bobby. Um, so I do what I call cooperative advantage, but I've really been on a very long-term journey um, of being in organizations in, in 25 countries and large complex change. But I wanted to start with Juliet's thing because I um, co-chair the advisory board for a company called Acclima. And Acclima started with innovations from the UC system and the Lawrence Berkeley Labs, as well as um, the Berkeley uh, School uh, in Air Pollution Sensors. They're doing their Series B right, uh, Series C right now, and they are on Google Street View cars, sensing the air in 50, uh, I mean, in 10 different pollutant areas. They have big contracts in California. And so um, there were, uh, uh, there was one uh, person, an academic, who, as he was retiring, he was in tears because it was the first time one of his innovations got commercialized. So uh, this is a big challenge, and it's one that we've been working with. So I, I just wanted to highlight that. I also had the honor to help Walmart begin their sustainability journey some years ago. I teamed with Conservation International and the founder of uh, Blue Sky, who I helped which I helped grow later. And so I've been in a lot of amazing places. Um, and I've also, I got inspired around what I call cooperative advantage because we brought the appreciative inquiry technique to Walmart and other places. And we um, combined this with how do you bring in insight and whole system emergence to um, really create uh, large change fast. And we did that for the dairy industry and other places. And so. I've, I've learned from so many amazing clients and I'm now wanting to see how to put this together in a more cohesive way so that it can come out of the strategies of large companies and it can be baked into alliances of many smaller companies. So that's uh, my, my life's work, really. Well, I think that there's uh, a mix in this room of where we're having the inchoate uh, champion and Caroline, I'm just going to put you on, on mute for a moment because I'm hearing the background noise, but you feel free to take you off mute when you'd like to re um, when, when you have audio moment later. But uh, just that uh, I think that we have some inchoate uh, institutions and we also have institutions at scale. One way to reach systems change is for the inchoate to get to scale. The other is to accelerate the evolution of those at scale towards systems. Uh, I'd like to bring in, uh, welcome Fyodor. If you'd like to introduce yourself, uh, I think that there's an adjacency of con context and I just want to get get uh, us across the, the group with giving each person a chance to introduce themselves from a systems change perspective. But would you like to, Fyodor, now? Sure. Thank you, Bobby. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Uh, well, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Fyodor Ovchinikov, uh, co-founder and managing partner of the Institute for Evolution Leadership in Oakland, California. Um, I'm working with uh, my uh, friend and mentor, Manuel Manga, uh, who is also co-founder and managing partner. And uh, we are uh, building leadership capacities for systemic change, um, for cultural and institutional transformation, um, and through educational programs primarily, and also strategic projects like Evolution of Future Challenge um, and uh, our fellowship program. Um, we, um, our approach is based on uh, a competency model that Manuel came up with uh, right near the time when I was in elementary school. Um, that is based on many um, uh, many things that uh, you've mentioned uh, in the, on this call, and I see some uh, people like Steve Waddell, for example, who know Manuel pretty well. Uh, so our approach in practice is pretty much grounded in uh, local communities. So that's 
you know, historically uh, where we've been most present with our offerings. Um, because I've uh, heard some people have more experience with large organizations um, or large corporations uh, we've been doing mostly. Uh, work with uh, um, uh, nonprofit organizations, local initiatives, and we've been also partnering with the uh, uh, University of Melbourne Asia Pacific Social Impact Center uh, to uh, bring their cutting edge academic research about how to uh, build systemic change initiatives in local communities from ground up uh, based on some very successful case studies in Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, and we've been contributing with our theoretic approaches and tools. Uh, to their uh, to their thinking, and we've been using their tools as well. So that's kind of the background that I when want to I, share. When I think about capacity building for systemic change, I think that Jim Rutt, who's joined us here on the call, has uh, in his work on Gain B, I think, been capacity building a community for systemic change, both in terms of language and uh, intersecting principles that allow for what was referred to in our prior call as alignment without agreement. Jim, did you want to introduce yourself for folks gathered here? Jim? Okay, if Jim's on mute, we'll come uh, back. There we go. All right, got it all. Go right. Hey, I'm Jim Rutt. I I uh, was a business guy for many years, helped build the internet and the stuff that came before the internet. I was then uh, uh, active uh, in a new career in complexity science research at the Santa Fe Institute. I ended up on the governance side there, ended up as the chairman. I'm still on the board of trustees. Uh, in 2012 and 13, myself and some friends started what has become the Game B movement, uh, which is a broad based, still more theory than practice, uh, attempt to design and eventually create uh, the social operating system of the future that replaces the status quo, so-called game A. And uh, as Bobby said, we have uh, developed a, a fair amount of theory, some language, uh, are just beginning to develop some practices uh, that combine the individual and the group into raising individual sovereign, effective sovereignty, which we believe is uh, necessary to help people see through the matrix, as we as we call it, of game A, and realize that it's just some shit some people made up, and that it's well within our power as sovereign humans working together in coherence uh, to bring on a truly massive social change and replace the status quo with something much better. That's phenomenal, Jim. Uh, I think that this brings up the thread of the, the work of Steve Waddell, because I think that if we think about capacity building for transforming each level of the system from individual to global, then the transformation itself is an area of theory and practice. Steve, would you like to introduce yourself for folks who haven't met you? Thanks, Bobby. Uh, so I'm co-lead of the SDG Transformations Forum. I've worked in the field of transformations for over 35 years. Uh, and when I'm focused upon transformation, it's at a societal level. So how do we realize societal transformation? Um, we're currently engaged in uh, two major initiatives. Um, we're a network of people who work on transformation, really, and think that it's got to go much more quickly. So given the COVID-19 crisis and the huge disruption in the traditional system, it's a point of vulnerability. So it's a time of vulnerability. So it's uh, a good time to try to accelerate transformation. So we're trying to do that with the um, new economies that have been developing. So we're doing, uh, we're just putting, finishing off right now a proposal um, that will be uh, for a global assessment of new economies, uh, engaging about a thousand people over the next four months uh, in a conversation and in virtual exchanges to be able to uh, develop um, the, synthesize some ideas around the new economies, particular opportunities, create infrastructure, and then carry that on into a global conversation and actions to be able to uh, implement the outcomes of that report and what makes sense in local contexts to uh, develop new economies. Um, thank you.
That's phenomenal. And it also brings to attention from a new economy's point of view, Tomas Carruthers has been working on a aspirational and inspirational it's systems change in finance that I'd warmly welcome to our hashtag systems change context. Tomas, Hello, Bobby. Like to Am I on mute? No, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Well, thank you for the introduction. As you know, I've been working on the concept of a systems change through a social stock exchange. Um, whether you've participated in the stock exchange or not, you must know that the securities laws that govern its behavior go back more than 100 years and therefore offer a perfect structure within which normal people, non-financial professionals, can move the capital that they own and the, the influence into purposes which are socially valuable. To do that, we've created a new set of listing rules which were partly endorsed by the World Economic Forum. Uh, I chaired the OECD Working Group two years ago on principles for impact investment. And we hope that with this new stock exchange, uh, social enterprise will be able to scale access to capital and institutional investors, and in fact, any one of us, can provide capital to them so that we could in fact flow capital towards a new economic system, rather consistent with what Steve's just been describing and with some of the work you're doing, Bobby. Uh, grateful for that introduction, and I think it's an important thread for us to have the capital systems to allow for systems change to happen, and that's why I'm a great supporter of the intention that uh, Tomas just shared. So I want to go Thank around uh, our other colleagues here. Of Jiap, um, uh, would you like to introduce you for people who haven't met you here on the call? Hi, Bobby. Hi. Yes, this is Jaap. I'm here in Belgium. I, I'm working for the European Commission in the Scientific Advice Mechanism, which is a, an attempt of a political body, international public body, to give uh, scientific, independent scientific advice on politically motivated questions. I have been participating in the OECD and in and i have the impression that the oecd is the freest intellectually freest and most sovereign body can yeah. think up uh, con intellectual concepts that truly that are truly motivated by the social well-being of mankind the european commission is embedded in the, in its initial uh, foundation, which is the European Economic Community. So, the economics is the founding reality, not the human sovereignty. And therefore, I would like to yield to the observation of the gentleman who, who uh, was working for the OECD, because there we can find a much deeper humanity than what the European Commission can provide at the moment. I'm working now in a scientific opinion on the follow-up of, uh, of the COVID crisis, but I can tell you everything is motivated by economic considerations. Thank you. Um, I think that that is uh, fascinating to cross-reference and grateful for the connection point to it's, yeah, for the introduction to Grant who got us uh, through the you know, suggestion of TOS to, to collaborate to have the school event that we did. But Grant, would you like to introduce yourself um, as a bridge from YAP yeah, to systems change here? Yeah, so uh, yeah, hi everybody. Um, Grant Halton. Um, yeah, so we're, we're a young organization called sustainavistas.org, um, driven out of a network coming out of the Cambridge University sustainability and business course. Um, we're, we're over 250 professionals, um, yeah, trying to do our thing. And um, yeah, so we, we, we link together because we believe actions are stronger and impacts are greater when uh, the knowledge, skills and tasks are shared and, and applied. Um, yeah, so we, we, we newbies on this, but um, yeah, obviously great, great to be part of this. And we've been working with Crowd doing uh, on, on the Debt for Nature uh, approach, which is quite a, quite a nice little project. But uh, we'd, we'd like to, uh, I find this one quite an interesting one because we're actually going to, to the interface where we, we think that is quite important to the, the you know, the, from the academic to the practical and some, some really, some nice, some nice new people on here, which we, we'd like to talk because we, we, we'd like to see how business actually, we can actually use, motivate business to do the systemic change. And that's, we think it's going to be the biggest challenge. And that's where we, 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 we that's the niche and area we try to apply with, with our network and, and the companies and partners we work with. 
And thank you, Grant. And with that, that context that we created together, I wouldn't have met Yangbo and we wouldn't be in conversation. So grateful for that. Yangbo, would you like to introduce yourself? Yangbo. All right, so I'm muted. Yes, so uh, very quickly, I'd like to this uh, school forum a couple of weeks ago. And just in short, uh, my focus is on uh, designing a financial products and instruments to bring impact in that uh, mainstream with flex based green infrastructure, uh, uh, transit, housing, uh, renewable power, all that depending on context, center stage. Uh, and um, right here, been tuning in some of those and trying to keep momentum going from the skull form with the series. Excellent. Thank you so much, Yangbo. And uh, we, it's been terrific to learn from you in these past weeks. Uh, likewise, we met Sanjay in the same context. Sanjay, would you like to introduce yourself? Sanjay? Uh, OK, if you're on mute, we'll come back to you. Um, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just as Yangbo, I connected with Bobby at the school uh, forum. And it was great to be around like-minded, passionate people. So I have a 20 plus years experience as a business strategist and consultant uh, working um, with the C-suite folks uh, in the industry, uh, multiple industry. I've also been a social entrepreneur. I'm on the board of a nonprofit called uh, Seva that focuses on preventable blindness around the globe. I run uh, Manuka Sustainability Advisors as a managing director. What I bring to the table is sort of a mix of uh, design thinking, lean, agile, with focus on social impact while taking innovations from concept to monetization. And fundamentally, as we all know, it's very important to think in terms of planet, people, and prosperity together. So uh, I'm really passionate about the SDGs as well as circular economy. I'm a member of the Catalyst 2030, uh, which has Steve Weddell also as part of it. And I'm looking to see how we can uh, apply and take action to make the SDGs real by 2030. I'm glad to be here. Phenomenal. Thank you so much, Sanjay. And this is this gathering is co-hosted by Crowd Doing, and Safki is our uh, the founder of the Match for Action Foundation, which is our joint venture partner in Crowd Doing. Saskia, would it be excellent to give you a chance to introduce yourself for folks who haven't met you. Thanks, Bobby. So I'm Saskia. I'm based in uh, New Zealand. I set up uh, Metro Action a few years ago as um, a, um, a not-for-profit to help accelerate change, to bring action to um, indeed towards resolving the SDGs to accelerate social impact. I also lead systemic change, um, basically doing what you're all uh, talking about in regards to how do businesses implement systemic change. I'm also an executive on a uh, global tourism uh, RV operator and implementing systemic change within that company on a global level, especially now after COVID, I'm really pushing hard to um, change our thinking completely. Which is which is really interesting to hear more more viewpoints from you all in regards to the academic and theoretical side of it that I can use to um, convince more people. So Excellent. really really cool to connect to you all. Excellent, thank you so much, Saskia. And uh, it's extremely exciting that uh, within a crowd doing context, we have a thousand volunteers who are connecting to our twenty initiatives, and that's uh, only feasible through the collaboration context here. Uh, just Chuck, uh, would you like to introduce yourself for folks who haven't met you? Yeah, thanks so much, Bobby, and for continuing to hold this space. Uh, I'll be quick. Yeah, Chuck Brown. Uh, so I run a small consultancy called Orion Advising, uh, working with startup and early stage social entrepreneurs, uh, primarily to help them develop more robust business models and also to get uh, capitalized. And I'm particularly interested in supporting uh, what we understand is underrepresented entrepreneurs here in the US, uh, women, uh, people of color, indigenous folks, LGBTQ, et cetera. Um, I also have had the honor of sitting on the local uh, San Francisco Bay Area chapter of Social Enterprise Alliance with Bobby uh, for the past year and a half. And we're getting more, much more involved now in kind of reshaping that national alliance. And when I think about uh, systems thinking, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about that in terms of how can we actually build a far more vibrant and uh, dynamic network of social entrepreneurs and, and enterprises uh, throughout North America. 
uh, learning from you know, so many better models internationally. Um, and then generally, uh, for folks who are familiar with the Just Transition model, which is developed by Movement Generation and the Edge Funders Alliance um, a few years ago, that's a really important framework for when I think about the economy, the living economy that I would like to live in, and I think we all would here. Thank you so much, Chuck. It's uh, terrific to contextualize that uh, our organization that you referred to hosted Colin to speak in San Francisco before the pandemic, which seems like an eternity ago, but Colin's here on the line. And so, Colin, would you like to introduce yourself? Colin? Hi, Bobby. Uh, yeah, um, so I'm based in Scotland. I've been working in social enterprises, social entrepreneurship for the last 20 odd years. I base my work on um, the framework of social capital, which is, and we use the OECD terminology for what social capital is. I use that to create a, an ecosystem of peer-to-peer -peer support for social entrepreneurs in Scotland, which has um, created 24 social enterprise networks which connect up one and a half thousand businesses in Scotland, making us one of the most hyper-connected social enterprise sectors in the world. And one of the things that I realized in that process is that um, the work that we're all doing in terms of trying to identify you know, positive outcomes rather than just financial outcomes was that social impact is, is intangible, and that means it's, it's difficult to measure. So we created a methodology which is now We've now um, put onto a platform so that we can measure, manage, report, and visualize basically collaboration through networks and scale those networks up um, into a macro level, which is in Scotland has changed our policy uh, infrastructure in terms of social enterprise for the last 10 years. One of the things that I'm quite interested about, and one, I think one of the reasons why I'm in, and seem to be involved in these conversations that you're hosting, Bobby, is that I, despite the fact that I've been involved in system change for 20 years, one of the things that I think has been challenging for people is understanding systems thinking. Systems thinking, in my opinion, is something that we really need to understand strategically to use uh, in a, a new economic strategy because um, the, the traditional financial system is still propping up a uh, reductionist um, approach which extracts uh, assets, both environmental and social, from all individuals. And we need a new approach, you know, and the people that are on these calls, I think, are in line with that. We need a new approach in terms of a theory. We need a new approach in terms of tools. And we need a new approach in terms of practice. And I think this stream here brings all those th things together, which is why I continue to be involved. N because I am I think, I just want to put this here, I think there's been a, a shift because of the, the pandemic and people are now much more comfortable working online at scale. But, but I'm not sure that the many of these conversations that I've been involved with lead to action. And in my case, the work that I've done with all of the people that you have in these calls has led to action, and I think that's exciting. So, thanks for uh, having these calls. Yeah. This call lessens the us into more greater feasibility for action to understand the systems change adjacencies throughout each other's work. In that context, Jack Park, you've been an advocate and champion of accelerating research to meet the scope of our collective needs. Did you want to introduce yourself in that context? Uh, sure. Thank you, Bobby. Um, I'm just sitting here in my. Uh, um, my uh, zero G chair. So if if I look like I'm about to fall asleep, I might be. But this group is too exciting. Um, look, I I, I co-founded a, a a nonprofit foundation in 2010 to help answer the question: How can we have civil conversations online about politics? And so. I, I did that just after I had defended a thesis proposal at the Open University uh, about boundary infrastructures for online sense making. And so uh, you can think of me as a boundary infrastructure guy. I, I really take the Engelbardian view that um, the 
human systems and the tool systems need to co-evolve together to uh, improve the capabilities infrastructure necessary to deal with these complex and urgent problems. So, so I come at it from the idea of how can I marry technologies like artificial intelligence and topic mapping and structured conversations and a variety of other technologies to improve the to improve the the way we work together the way we do our sense making and decision making and acting so so that's 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 the worldview that i bring to this conversation inviting me in absolutely and one way of thinking about sense making is sense making with uh, a value driven process and carl has connected to social justice and capitalism with fair share did you want to introduce yourself carl for folks who haven't met you yeah carl hi uh can you hear me yes carl shergren oakland california uh author of uh can you see me yes i can see you we can see you okay so there's the book I wrote, The Fair Share Model, and it's about a performance-based capital structure for venture stage initial public offerings. And uh, to pick up on thoughts I heard from a couple of people, Colin mentioned uh, system thinking, thinking. My, my approach is to think small uh, in terms of how to evolve systems of thinking between in one company that adopts a model uh, because it requires a, a uh, agreement between investors and employees as to how to define and measure performance. So I suppose that's also in line with what Jack was mentioning, human systems and tool systems co-evolving together. Um, it's, it's, I view the fair share model as more of a tool system that different groups of people can use to create the type of outcomes or the types of existence they like in a capitalistic world. In the spirit of that, you referenced the systems thinking context and uh, systems innovation. Um, yeah, it doesn't say uh, w whether that's who I think it is, but would you like to introduce yourself? No. Okay, we'll come back to you. Uh, context would, uh, would be uh, the other uh, folk. Caroline, Lou, did you want to introduce yourself for folks who haven't met you? Hey, Bobby. Uh, welcome. I hey, this you. is Joss. Hi, Joss. Welcome, <laughs> Joss. How are you doing? Sorry, I just jumped in now, so I missed the beginning of your, your talk there. Um, what, do you just want me just, to give a little... Just, uh, just a brief introduction of uh, your, your, your world as it connects to systems change context. Sure, sure. Um, so my name is Joss Colster. I uh, founded Systems Innovation about five, six years ago. Um, we're an online platform. Um, we're really uh, an e-learning platform, so we do a lot of educational stuff around uh, systems thinking and complexity theory, but then how that applies in uh, many different areas, particularly around innovation and systems change. Um, we also more recently kind of moved towards a kind of community collaborative platform model. So we have like a social network of about three, 4,000 members kind of spread around the world. There's also a number of organizations there, and we're really trying to empower them with the knowledge, the research, um, you know, events, um, connecting people, um, trying to build a, an ecosystem, a community of systems innovators, and um, yeah, raise awareness, uh, improve kind of around the models and methods and education and so forth, um, and yeah, build up the connectivity also, um, just in terms of online events, offline events, a little bit similar to what you have going on here. We do something like, like this, yep. Well, it's in the context, I'd say, that uh, systems change uh, requires us to be in a collective collaboration where feasible and we're joyful, but we, we can achieve uh, alignments without agreement per the Jim Rutt quote from last week. So uh, mm -hmm. to close out the rest of, I think we've gotten round the circle except for uh, Caroline. Caroline, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I can introduce myself. So I'm Caroline from Oakland, California. I am a product designer learning all these different issues that are popping up. Um, I definitely want to take part into um, organizations and with leaders who are truly passionate about creating 
a better humanity. That's a grand um, statement, but it's very all encompassing of what I want to be as a product designer. Grateful for the connection point from every social innovation that can consider stakeholders as a systems change opportunity. Tanuja, would you like to introduce yourself for folks who haven't met you on the call? Hello, everyone. Sorry. Yes, I'm here. Um, hi, everyone. Sorry for being so late. I am calling in from India, where it is around 1 a.m. Um, I've been involved with, uh, with crowd doing and Bobby for some years now, since the early days, actually. And um, I am uh, myself a, f a fintech uh, person involved with Wall Street for many years and trying to bring those uh, skills to the uh, impact sector, where I think we are... We are at a turning point, I think, in the sector with the pandemic, the issues, and um, the attention that is coming our way with uh, what needs to happen after this pandemic. So I think there's threads of what needs to happen after this pandemic, and maybe that's something to flag for Michael Cortelli because he's been identifying the uh, dimension of preventing a second wave of the pandemic. So if we think about the pandemic as uh, the short, medium, and long term, I think that uh, rhyming with that, you've identified in the past with the circular economy of risk. If this is a context for all the risks that have been neglected in humanity to get prevented at greater level, I think that would be an important consequence of the crisis. But Michael, did you want to speak to your theory there around how uh, uh, tension is something that uh, is uh, might be communicable to stakeholders who've never uh, understood that? as a opportunity collectively before? Yeah, um, one of the things I didn't mention in my background is um, one of the things I did in parallel at Pitney Bowes to my leadership on the operational side was create a culture of health and we moved very far upstream to, um, you know, the, the traditional health model was primary prevention, which would be something like an immunization, Secondary would be a screening. Tertiary would be keeping people with chronic conditions in a chronic state versus an acute state. But I started to work upstream of that to uh, what's called primordial prevention, which is what is the environment that we can create to keep uh, that if people operate normally in that environment, the healthy activity is the easy thing to do. And uh, there are really two things, one of which Bobby brought home to me very emphatically, which is this whole idea of a better relationship with nature to reduce uh, the uh, zoological transfer of pathogens. And I've done, Bobby, I've done a fair amount of work and investigation just between um, Monday when we talked about it and today. And the second is what kind of culture of hygiene and uh, cleanliness and preventive care and basically chronic disease uh, management do we create so that people have strong, first of all, they're not in as unhealthy an environment. Secondly, they are not, uh, they have stronger immune systems. We can detect through biomonitoring when people have been infected even before they have symptoms. So you create multiple layers of prevention. And uh, at the bottom of all this, and this is the point I made to Bobby, and it's been my work for almost 30 years, we have here what uh, you mentioned, some, one of you was from India. Uh, I'm, I sat next to the public health director of India at the time, back probably 13, 14 years ago at, a world, at the World Economic Forum. And he said, chronic diseases are a public health crisis in slow motion. And what's happened with the coronavirus is we've taken a slow motion crisis and we've, pre and we've used an accelerant. And so a lot of people with shortened lifespan ended up with very short lifespans because of compromised immune systems. So although we do have to protect ourselves from pathogenic interventions into our environment, the number one factor that we have to work on as a society is uh, reducing the burden of chronic disease.
And that's something that uh, is core to the prevention strategy that I'm working on. I wanted to flag this to the context of both uh, Jim Rutt. Uh, did you want to re respond to some of these threads? I know that in your podcasts you've been connecting to some of the intentionality that was alluded to by Michael there. Yeah, I'm not sure. I have actually looked into the couplings between uh, chronic disease and the pandemic, though obviously it's a, a key factor when you look carefully at where the uh, actual deaths and serious uh, hospitalizations are occurring. It's clearly at the intersection of pre-existing conditions uh, and the pandemic. So I, uh, so not an area I've dug into tremendously, but clearly a very important part of thinking about it. And, and I think one of the learnings that will come out of this is that uh, we'll be able to unfortunately use this very expensive event as a probe to show many of the shortcomings in our own public health infrastructure, both in the United States and, and around the world. Uh, you know, that uh, you look at where communities of color are being disproportionately hammered by, you know, a factor of 3x or more. Uh, I think that shows that our public health uh, resources are not being fairly allocated and our uh, personal health uh, resources are not being fairly allocated. So I think that's the potentially very useful takeaway here is that this probe is showing the weaknesses of our uh, public health and healthcare systems. Yep, I saw that you were typing in the chat a number of threads that also build on the same. Did you want to share that uh, on audio? Do you want to share that, Yep. Thank you, thank you Bobby. Yeah. Um, um, thank you for allowing me to interview um, on this. Maybe I, I want to use a, a reference. Maybe you know this play. It's a French playwright. His name was Eugene Unesco. Unesco. He wrote this play. It's called Le Rhinoceros, which means the rhinoceros. And that was an epidemic in a society which created this desire in human beings to become a rhinoceros. And the main character, Berenger, he resists to become a rhinoceros, to go with the flow until the end. And then he, then he subsides and he gives in and he also wants to become a rhinoceros. And much of the discussion that I have through the going last weeks with my colleagues in the European Commission, where I work for in the scientific advice mechanism, they are around this theme. So how can we uh, create a better society, uh, social and sustainable, whilst, get, uh, whilst um, not jeopardizing the economic basis that we have created so far? And my the conclusion we come to, unfortunately, is either we let for the political powers that are at this moment um, continue the economic strata that exist, or we go into something fundamentally different. So for the moment, and now we speak the 8th of May, 2020. And for the moment, there is no alternative. We continue so either the or, and we either let it restart, or we go uniquely different. So, so far, I, we found have a bridge and hub, a connector that can combine the old you, and the either or. That's where we are at this moment. Well, so in spirit of, I think there's colleagues on the line here that cherish the impact potential of the inchoate and the fledgling to reach the scale and scope of our collective challenges. I think that if you see that as a sequence from research context to all the way getting to scale, I think there's different stages on that journey that we're intersecting in different ways. Uh, one way to start with that is, I was going to reflect that, uh, Juliet, did you want to speak to the challenges that the social innovation ecosystem that uh, you, you represent, as it were, are facing and getting to the scale of collective challenges as an emblematic dimension? Because I do think there's ways to think about the bridge towards collective agency as reflective of a series 
overcoming the friction of interdisciplinary disjuncture and social capital gaps such as those that Collins might be uh, uh, AI for in his context. But Juliet, did you want to speak to that context? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think um, the reason an organization like mine exists is because uh, the system that exists in academia is not one that is particularly good at transferring um, the knowledge that it, that it creates into a, a real world outcome. Um, and so, I, you know, I think the person uh, who was on the line previously was it David, who was saying the story of the, the academic who cried when one of their innovations became real. I mean, that's, that's such a powerful um, metaphor, I'm not even metaphor, but like story because it's so true because the incentives that are aligned and exist within academia um, are such that you are promoted for creating more research, not for your research actually going out and being um, impactful and used and, and applied in the real world. Um, and so there's a huge systemic change issue there uh, that, that you know would need to happen for us to be really harnessing the true power of the innovation um, body of work and uh, system that we have within academia. I think that that's a really interesting thread to connect back to Tomas's intentionality of getting the social innovations that we need in the world resourced proportionately to our collective needs of them. Tomas, did you want to speak to such? Tomas? Okay, Tomas is on mute. Uh, we can come back to that thread. So, uh, but I think that this is really interesting for multiple reasons. Steve, did you want to speak to the gap? I think that a lot of the transformations that are across the ecosystem that you've orchestrated are each uh, narrative bridges to collective agency, but there's often not the context for them to reach the scale and scope of their impact potential in isolation. Is that part of the way you uh, uh, would identify with the SDG transformation forum? Steve? I'll show you, share with you um, one of the a slide that I think um, uh, will help uh, understand um, what we're, we're seeing happening in the field of the um, economy. Hmm. Uh, can you see this adoption yeah. curve? Uh, so this was um, this is a very simple way of describing adoption of innovations. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. Uh, Rogers wrote about this in 1962. Um, uh, in 1992, 91, 92, Jeffrey Moore uh, pointed out that this is not a smooth uh, process of moving around this adoption curve and that there are specific breaks in it and he referred in particular to the chasm the chasm so we have innovators and early adopters in our case we're focused upon the development of the new economy and we're interested in that the new economies becoming uh, the a new eco the economies um and we can see that we have circular economy um common good economy regenerative economy um uh, donut economy there's there's a lot of early adopter and innovator work that has been done um and the question is how we can then move across the chasm to become to attract and engage the early majority the challenge in part is that the those who are very successful in early adopter in innovator modality uh, their very ways of acting um their their dependence upon charisma of absolute passion it's um they're uh just driving things through by personal sheer will are not what's going to attract the early majority the early majority is much more conservative. They want to have some clear arguments, some clear pathways, infrastructure built to support them, and clearly demonstrated um, new ways of acting that they can have a lot of faith in. So in one way, uh, this is what we think we're facing with the uh, development of the new economies. This is, of course, not even across 
all economic <laughs> issues. The sustainable energy uh, field, for example, in many places in the world is in the early majority development. But if you take things like banking systems and um, very innovative um, new economy money systems, uh, they're way back at the other end of the innovators line. So this is just one way to conceptualize the overall challenge we're facing with big issues. I think that that's extremely relevant to say getting to systems change is a question of getting a social innovation context adopted by stakeholders at each of the scales and scopes that you've identified with. I want to connect that also to David Sherman, because if we think about cooperation, I think there's often a focus on uh, cooperative advantage among institutions of like scale. But part of what we're also alluding to is how do we get institutions of every stage of scale on the spectrum from tiny to vast to be in coordination and collaboration for systems change. And maybe that's when we reach the tipping point that got alluded to by Steve. But did you want to speak to the threads you've heard in such context? Well, I will uh, speak to a couple of examples of these multiple scales, and these have been more physical examples, um, teaming with David Cooperider, who developed Appreciative Inquiry. Uh, we did one for the dairy industry, greenhouse gas, and brought the whole value chain together with uh, things of all different levels and uh, helped uh, create deep connections and deep conversation around different things and created a shared vision, a bunch of innovation projects and launched those. And then within the Walmart work, we developed all of these sustainable value networks. Now, Walmart had the advantage of, they had the ability to convene, but I even walk, worked with one of their um, suppliers in the magazine industry and we had Walmart do the convening. So if we have someone who convene, can convene, we can bring organizations of many different levels together. And sometimes we bring you know, multiple conveners together. Um, and then this can have a lot of online things afterwards, but there's something magical about actually having a three-day summit with a whole system in the room, informing it with some insight, but having a lot of emergence happening. So well, people during, really during a pandemic, that may not be as feasible as it otherwise would be. But no, uh, in a pandemic, normal. though, it's really interesting. I ran across some software. I could put it in in the thing here. A virtual. Um, convenings where you can sit around different tables together, you can move from table to table, see the people at the table and have side conversations. So I'm now seeing that's virtual ways that can copy this. I don't know. Uh, so I think there's an emerging uh, new way of operating that could go beyond the physical if we need to. I, I would love that to, to occur and get to feasibility. And I think that this uh, brings up that part of what we're talking about is tacit knowledge networks. Dominique Foray's economics of knowledge is on the navigation of knowledge and learn through others. And tacit knowledge networks are ideal for handling interdisciplinary complexity. Tanusha, did you want to speak on any of the threads that you've heard in terms of the intersections with complexity that get, might get in the way or make feasible certain intentionalities? So um, many points have been made about the efforts that have been ongoing or been made in the past. Um, I'd like to say that the systemic viewpoint, the systemic lens, is a somewhat new lens, I think, uh, that in a way brings together a lot of the efforts that have happened. Sorry, I don't say brings it together, but can bring it together, all of the work that has happened before. Um, so what I'm saying here is that it is a dimension that was not considered in the older efforts. By older, I mean, you know, 20 plus years ago. Uh, I know this may be a controversial point, uh, but I do think that, that the systemic lens br uh, brings to the table a viewpoint on the society aspect, the actual biological aspect, the uh, economic aspect, all of that, which has, which has non-linear dynamics and which I think has not been considered before. Yeah. So I'm not trying to say the systemic uh, lens is a, is a new tool that will solve all problems, 
but I am saying that it is an intrinsic part of the nature of the system we live in that hasn't been considered before. I think that this is terrific. And uh, Caroline's uh, comment in the chat, we certainly do convene collaborations at every level of this system and ha happy to be supportive of that feasibility. Fyodor, did you want to speak to this context that connects from the bridge from academic to actualization that you alluded to that uh, connects? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, and I was just submitting a message in the chat right now. Um, yeah, so what we see as uh, a disconnect, as I said, that we, we've uh, had an opportunity to work with uh, grassroots initiatives, and we've seen some uh, very powerful cases. Some of them are academically verified, so um, published in, in AA plus journals. Uh, but uh, the uh, support mechanisms that we see uh, operating at scale, uh, national, global, and even, even regional uh, support systems, philanthropy, to be uh, impact investing um, and even uh, different competitions and uh, uh, solutions journalism. Um, they very often overlook these initiatives or highlight um, aspects of those initiatives that are either non-essential uh, or um, even um, misleading, I would say. Um, and that is um, that really hinders cross-network learning in many, many cases. And uh, this makes a lot of people feel like um, the early adopters or the, the early cases of systemic change are not present in the system, which is not true. There are many cases of very powerful innovation happens. But as uh, I recall, one of our Evolution Future Challenge from 2018 said, I don't take money from US foundations. And we said, why? Uh, and she said, because they gave us uh, $500, like really, literally $500 for their initiative at, uh, in Kenya. And she said, and then uh, um, they made us uh, use much more resources to report on 4,000 girls in this uh, area that, uh, uh, over the years. So they present to their, um, uh, 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 you know, to, the, to, to their stakeholders that they're super effective uh, by uh, having great impact on these $500, where in fact, they kind of use it as a hook to extract value from that initiative. Uh, very often, like you look at OpenIDEO, for example, and their challenges, and uh, uh, we analyzed 255 ideas uh, that were submitted for their challenge with UNFPA. Uh, we, we considered nine of them systemic, none of those nine ideas made it through, and they were harassed in the comments for doing exactly the right thing from uh, what we know from academic research in our own practice works. So, um, and these initiatives uh, that 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 start locally, um, in many cases, these people don't have a lot of theoretical background, but uh, they 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 do care deeply about the issues, and they understand that um, um, reductionist approach would not work. So they are flexible. They are learning from the practice. They're doing incredible things, and instead instead of being connected with uh, theories and mentorship that could support them uh, when they apply for funding or they seek recognition at at a, lower, at a different level, uh, they are faced with uh, this uh, good old uh, conventional old uh, you know uh, mentoring and requirements. And either they uh, conform with those requirements and lose their uh, uh, their systemic uh, nature, uh, or uh, they stay small and nobody will know about them, or like very few people know about them. And overcoming this disconnect, um, I see as one of the uh, most pressing challenges uh, if we want uh, this innovation to, to, to be scalable. I think that that's uh, exciting to consider how to overcome these challenges. Uh, we're getting closer to the edge of time, but I wanted to see, Saskia, did you have any commentary on what we've discussed here that you wanted to share before we wrap up for today? Um, I think we all provide pieces to that puzzle. I thought it was really interesting to, um, to look at that uh, innovation adoption curve and seeing the place, actually, that crowd doing plays in that to provide, hopefully, the, the facts and information that that early majority is looking for to be convinced to join us in our in our approach towards uh, systemic change i think that's where um, we can play a really important role with um, with crowd doing so just thought i'd throw that out 
Th thank you so much, Saskia, and I thoroughly agree. We're going to have to wrap up momentarily, but Nick, any last words before we adjourn from y your yourself by way of feedback on these threads? Nick? Or uh, Jack, would you like to offer any feedback on what you've heard today? Uh, only that this, uh, I, I got a lot of great links out of the chat room and that uh, I'm anxious to contact Caroline to talk about UX on boundary infrastructures. There's a lot of good stuff going on today. Ph phenomenal. And uh, likewise, uh, Grant, any last words before we adjourn? Okay. All good. Uh, thank you. Oh, go ahead, Nick. Oh, thanks, Bobby. I, I say thank you for the opportunity. Apologies, I was gone for about 30 minutes. So, uh, All good. Uh, thanks to the group. Thank you, everybody, for joining us here today for hashtag systemic change. We'll share this publicly. Hey, hey, Bobby, can, Bobby, can I share one thing? Go ahead, yes. I'm going to present uh, a screen here, uh, if I can. Darn it. It's... Can you see that? No. Nope. No, you can't. Sorry. Maybe next week. Sorry. Next time. Let's uh, return to it if uh, it'll work next time. Well, uh, just, 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 just to, to summarize, I, I had used the, the chart that Steve had uh, used, the, the growth curve thing in my book, The Fair Share Model. And it was the early part there. Instead of calling it a chasm, I called it a concept gap. And I think. For a lot of the things we're talking about, we're all sharing a concept gap. And the things is, will people like it? Uh, and can it work? And if, if, if you get those early adopters to experiment with something, then you have a chance to to uh, to grow it. The one thing I pointed out on mine was Hofstadter's law. And Hofstadter's law is it always takes longer than you expect, even when you take Hofstadter's law into account. I think that's fascinating. I see Tomas is back. Uh, Tomas, any last words before we adjourn? No, thank you, Bobby. I've really enjoyed the conversation. I look forward to joining next week. Phenomenal. And uh, thank you all so much for collaborating on Hashtag Systemic Change. We're at time here, so we're going to have to wrap up, but we look forward to the continuation of these threads. It's only feasible for us to uh, have a goal of systems change in cahoots with folks across disciplinary lines because there are no folks who are Leibniz anymore knowing all the fields that are taught at all the universities in the continent or any of the equivalent. There's too many fields, and so there's a necessity of collaborating across disciplinary lines. Um, thank you all, and I look forward to continuing the threads on a future occasion soon. Have a phenomenal Friday. Take care.